Good morning and welcome to the September quarterly meeting of the New York City Workforce Development Board. I am Audrea Powell. Of, uh, I chair this board um, and I hope everyone is settling in after the summer and had some really good things that went on during the summer and is, are ready to hit the ground running for this fall. Uh, we are thrilled to be joined today by Annie. Um, uh, sorry. Garneva, uh, Interim Chief Executive Officer of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition, and Sharon Sewell Fairman, CEO of Workforce Professional Training Professionals Training Institute. Ms. Um, Ms. Garnevera and Ms. Sewell Fairman will provide some highlights of a report that their organizations jointly released with the Center of New York of New Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. The report is called the New York City Workforce Landscape, and I'm happy to um, share that CHCA as a workforce development uh, organization actually provided information along with many, many others. So I can't wait to really uh, dive into this. We're also excited to welcome Miles Gamble, who recently started as the Director of Employer Engagement at the Mayor's Office of Youth Employment. And you'll hear later from Abby Jo Siegel through Executive Order 22 that was issued by the mayor last month, how um, the Office of Youth and Employment Services has merged with the mayor's Office of Ta uh, Talent and Workforce Development. So before we kick off for the meeting, just to go through some of the meeting protocols, um, this is a video meeting. Um, and as a longstanding policy, we ask that board members, only board members speak during the meeting. However, members of the public may ask questions by submitting them in the chat. And I just want to check because I was only seeing, um, I had not seen a bunch of uh, messages in the chat. So I'm not sure if my chat is limited um, or if there's some limitations on the chat. As a guest, I don't see an option for the chat. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. As a guest, I don't see an option for the chat. Okay. So I think at the top there is a chat um, button, and I only see maybe two comments in there. So if that's, oh, well, okay. I see. Yes, Laura, thank you. Yes, okay. Looks good. Thank you all. Um, please remain muted if you are not speaking, and members should state their full name each time they speak. Please also note that we are recording today's meeting and that we will be posting the recording online, which is required by New York State Open Laws, uh, Open Meetings Law. So the next course of business is going to be to approve the minutes if we have quorum. So Grant, are we good to go? Yes, we are. Okay. We're good to go. Excellent. Um, so the June meeting minutes can be found in the electronic board packet on pages two to eight. Um, I hope folks had a chance to take a look at them. And um, I would like to request a motion to approve those minutes from the June 8th. I'll make a motion, Andrea. It's Laura James. Thank you, Laura. Can I have a second? Joe McDermott is second. Thank you, Joe. All in favor, you can put the thumbs up, say eyes, do something in the yes chat. <laughs> Looks good. Anybody abstaining? Do I have any abstentions? Okay. Thank you all. So now I will turn it over to Chris uh, to provide a director's report to the board. Hi everybody again, sorry, apologies for the, the technical difficulties. For some reason, I cannot get on Teams this morning. Um, I just have a very uh, brief report to provide today. Um, we are at a unique time where uh, we're actually due on both the adult side and youth side of the house uh, to competitively bid out for vendors. Um, 
And so that means that we are going to be releasing at some point in the not too distant future, a request for proposals for the Workforce One Career Centers and a uh, concept paper for the in-school youth and out-of-school youth, otherwise known as Learn and Earn and Train and Earn uh, for the, the Youth We Owe programs. So I just wanted to mention that here, we will be soliciting feedback from board members uh, to um, help inform what those RFPs look like. And Abby's gonna talk a little bit more about the Future of Workers Task Force and the direction uh, that the city is moving in in terms of the workforce development vision and strategy. Um, but our intent is to make sure that those RFPs are uh, really aligned with that context, which is to say that they're they're building off of the uh, the direction of this administration in terms of workforce. Um, so that's that's it from me. Back to you, Adria. You're on mute, Adria. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to have a brief update on the summer youth employment program from Valerie Mulligan. I did see Valerie. Valerie is the deputy commissioner of Youth Workforce Connect at DCYD. Good morning, everyone. Can can you all hear me? Yes, awesome. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to share. Um, some of the takeaways of this year's, you know, really unprecedented expansion of SYEP. Um, the program ended in mid-August, and so we've just at DYCD started to really intentionally look at how it went to capture some of the strengths, successes, lessons learned. Um, and so I wanted to share with this group some of our immediate takeaways and, and numbers of what we accomplished this summer. So first and foremost, the city successfully placed over 100,000 young people in jobs, internships, or work-based learning opportunities this summer. Um, for, for context as to how that compares to previous years, that's 25,000 more than the city's previous largest uh, program, which was last year. So that's really a significant accomplishment by um, all of our partners who are involved in this program, DYCD, uh, DOE, and of course, City Hall, employers, and so, so many more who really stepped up to make this happen. Um, we had young people placed at over 18,000 work sites across the city. Um, that's 4,000 more unique work sites than last year. So again, a huge lift. The numbers this year were just um, absolutely breathtaking in terms of what we were able to, to accomplish. Um, I really was excited to see how much participation we got from employers across the city. This year, there was so much momentum and we had a really great array of offerings across all sectors. Um, Something that was really exciting for us and that we got really good feedback on is our city government placements. Um, every single city agency stepped up to take young people. We had 5,000 participants placed in city agency jobs. Um, and what we were able to do with that was really, you know, build in additional opportunities for young people to learn about careers in civil service through those placements. Um, and the young people really, really gave us positive feedback about what those opportunities could offer. Um, we also worked really hard to expand the number of ways that employers could work with SYEP. So not just serving as placement, uh, you know, opportunities, but we intentionally built out an array of what we called enrichment opportunities, but this was things like career panels, site visits. Um, so we had employers who maybe weren't quite ready to step up and, and host an intern, pull together some incredible uh, opportunities for us to invite participants to. We had career panels with Wells Fargo, site visits with Microsoft at the Experience Center, Google, Con Edison, um, City Hall, right? The list goes on and on. Um, careers in culinary. We had an event at Gracie Mansion uh, where we brought a number of celebrity chefs to talk to our young people about healthy eating and also how to turn that into a career in the culinary field. So 
Um, that to me was a major uh, move forward in terms of building quality into SYEP this year. And I really hope that we can all work together to build on that because not only was it a great way to engage employers in a new way, but the participants absolutely loved having opportunities beyond what was in their, their uh, work site. And then the final thing I wanted to share was just that DYCD was absolutely uh, more intentional about, intentional about how we targeted slots this year. So we worked really closely with DOE to make sure that we were working in schools that had high economic needs index. We were uh, working really closely with NYCHA to make sure we were prioritizing young people who live in NYCHA buildings. And so that is work that we hope to continue um, as we move SYP forward uh, in, into the future. Uh, and stay tuned because next year is the 60th anniversary of the Summer Youth Employment Program in New York City. And so I think there will be a lot of really exciting things coming up to highlight everything that SYEP is and can be and that we'd like it to be in the future. So um, thank you again. If there are any questions, I'm here. Otherwise, great to see you all this morning. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, one quick question. When you were talking about the enrichment track, was that for the, the um, youth who were engaged and placed at work sites, and then it was sort of like a, a supplement to it, or was that actually, I see you saying yes. <laughs> Yeah, so it would be like, you know, let's say you had a placement. I mean, it was a whole bunch of different things, so there's no one answer to this, but it would be, let's say you were placed um, in a in a financial sector job, right? We would invite you to then, and you were at Chase, we would invite you then to join a career panel with Wells Fargo, where you could hear from a number of folks who work at Wells Fargo about what their career uh, options are. Um, let's say you were working at Maimonides in a healthcare field, right? We would bring you to a site visit of another hospital or to, a, a you know, the medical examiner's office to, to, to learn about more options uh, and career opportunities uh, in that field. Great. Thank you for that. That helps to clarify. Any other questions for Valerie? Audrey, it's Joe Kenner. I have one question. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, uh, of the 100,000 that were placed, like, do you track how many of that 100,000 actually end up working <coughs> for some of these companies? You mean post SYEP? Uh, post the program. So we, we don't track that, um, but we are trying to, like, you know, we do do surveys of all the young people afterwards to find out where they end up after the program. We're in the process of issuing that survey now. Um, and I'm happy to share what comes out of that survey with this group once we were able to gather the data. There are no other questions. We will move on. Sounds like a really impactful summer. And exciting to know that uh, the 60th anniversary is next year. So I can imagine we're going to want to engage this board um, to really help uplift that. Thank you. Um, so we are now pleased to welcome someone new to our meetings, Janine jones Sayo, who was recently appointed to the position of Assistant Commissioner of Workforce One. Janine will be providing the update on adult WIOA activities for SES. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, and I apologize about coming on screen. I'm actually at a New York City um, Coral Leadership Conference. Um, so I'm tucked in the corner <laughs> right now. So also ignore any of the background noise that you may be hearing. Um, so to start off with, I will say we're pleasantly um, we're pleasantly pleased with the progress that we've been seeing uh, to date. We know that we're moving in the right direction and, and, and assume that for FY23 we'll continue to do so. Um, the number of individuals that have served in FY 2022, we've saw we've seen a, a bit of an increase. So we were able to see and service about 81,000 individuals all across New York City. We're also happy to announce that the number of job opportunities that we have worked with um, with employers across New York City has also increased to about 25%. In, in terms of total hires, that's also increased um, between FY21 and FY22. We saw about a 25% increase. We were able to um, put people into opportunities or positions um, with, 
within 25,000 different opportunities. So we're extremely happy with that. We've actually are meeting our targets and our goals and we'll continue to do so. Um, right now, our average wage had decreased just slightly um, in FY21. We were at $18.15. FY22, we reported um, $18.04. I'll circle back to that um, in terms of our plans um, for FY23 and our intent to increase that overall. For overall trainings, we're happy to announce that the old, while the overall enrollments have decreased, and that's largely due to some of the larger recruitment activities that we had previously in FY21 that we aren't we weren't going to see in FY22, our overall hires in training has increased by 15%. We were able to connect um, 765 individuals that have gone through our training programs um, into job placements so far. To talk a little bit about our plans for FY23, again, we want to continue to see an improvement. We want to to continue to increase capacity. Previously, we had limited the number of individuals that we were able to serve at any given time. Um, previously, we were only able to see about, we um, had shared with the centers they could only see about five people within any, within any specific event. We're gonna be increasing that number to 15 individuals um, by October 1st. So we expect and anticipate that will allow us to service more individuals and connect um, them to employment. Um, that'll specifically have the benefits in terms of some of our workforce readiness and job readiness opportunities and programs. Um, so we're excited about that. We are also gonna be implementing a mid-wage goal for our centers. Um, so we will have our system, about 15% of the goals that we have stated will be um, at an a wage average of $20 or more across our system. There is one exception within our healthcare system. We expect that they will place 20% of their opportunities will be at $30 or more. Um, and then finally, as some of you may know, know um, we have been really focusing and have uh, provided customized services for a set of targeted populations over the last two to three years. We will continue to do so. Um, the targeted populations are inclusive of veterans, out of school, out of work youth, justice involved and foreign born New Yorkers. We see a real opportunity, particularly because of the effects of COVID, um, an opportunity to continue to increase um, our service model um, and improve our service model for both the justice involved and out of school, out of work, out of work youth over the over the coming year, and and really expect that we'll be able to continue to place individuals in more diverse opportunities as well as increase the overall number of individuals connected to jobs. And with that, I will open the floor for any questions. Janine, can you just talk a little bit about um, the difference in the average wage target um, for healthcare mm -hmm. versus the rest of the industry? Yeah, we see a real opportunity. Healthcare in itself, typically, we're able to identify uh, more opportunities at better wage targets. Um, so, with that, we really decided to continue. To, they've they've always had higher goals in the rest of the system. So, with that, we wanted to move into direction to really ensure that we were provi providing even more opportunities um, for individuals themselves. Thank you. If there aren't any other questions um, for Janine, we will uh, thank you for the report and thank you for taking the time uh, out of the uh, session that you're in. Um, next, we're going to welcome a couple of external guests, as I said earlier in um, my opening. I am pleased to introduce Annie Garneva, Interim Chief Executive Officer of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition, and Sharon Sewell Fairman, CEO of the Workforce Professionals Training Institute. Their bios are in the electronic board packet that everyone received. And um, they're going to talk to us about a report that provides extensive information about the scope of organizations that make up the workforce um, ecosystem. 
the types of services and where and how they're offered. And it describes the current state of affairs in the sector. And I'm really excited to have um, both Annie and um, Sharon talk to us about this report. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us. Been attending these meetings for a very long time, so it's really great to be a, a presenter and be able to share some of our findings uh, as well as talk through um, a couple of action steps and takeaways that we've garnered from the report um, and ways that we can all work together to make some improvements to the ecosystem. Uh, Chris, do we have our presentation? Also flagging that as um, I think it was Rebecca previously that mentioned as guests, we don't seem to have the chat function. So um, I'll follow up with Chris down the line to share a couple of links that we have to both the report and some important events uh, that are coming up that I think would be helpful for everybody. I'm, I'm going to share my screen. All right, um, so I'll kick us off and just want to make sure that Sharon is there because I don't see her on my. Hi, uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Sharon So Fairman here, the CEO of um, Workforce Professional Training Institute. I am here, Annie. And um, uh, if you could put the presentation in slide view, uh, that would be much appreciated. And so um, I will follow Annie um, in, pre in um, presenting, and so I'll come a little bit later, but good morning, everyone, and it's a, it's a great opportunity to share this information with you. All right, perfect, thank you. All right, um, so uh, if you could actually go to the next slide. Uh, like um, Adria said previously, our this report was done in collaboration with uh, between NYCTC, WPTI, and the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. Um, this report was achieved through a survey of 143 organizations. Most of those were ETC membership. Uh, we want to make sure that it is understood that this is just a portion of the workforce system, uh, but representative of the broader ecosystem. Uh, this report attempts to make a full uh, kind of give a full understanding of the landscape. But again, this does not supplement the bigger need uh, that we've talked about for a very long time of a full database of all workforce organizations and multi service organizations across the city, uh, a rough estimate gets us to about four or 500 organizations that are serving, uh, doing some form of workforce development, training and employment services. Um, and so clearly this is just a small slice of that, but a representative slice nonetheless. Um, the organizations range from small neighborhood focused organizations to larger multi-service organizations with national presences uh, ranging you know, in budget size from $250,000 a year to $20 million across all five boroughs. While most were multi-service organizations, nearly a third focus exclusively on workforce, and we'll kind of delve into that a little bit later. Uh, next slide. So um, as you can see, the bulk of respondents are small to mid-size organizations. And it's important to view these organizations as employers themselves uh, who are both serving workforce clients, but are also employers with workforces of their own. Uh, and so some of the recommendations and discussion that we'll have down the line 
are also looking at the needs of the workforce within the workforce development sector itself. Their organizational budgets range from 200, less than 250,000 to 20 million annually, uh, with about a third of organizations falling in the budgetary range between one and 100, uh, sorry, between one and 10 million annually. While a majority of the respondents were multi-service organizations, nearly a third focused on workforce exclusively, and about uh, nine of the nine fit neither profile. Both multi-service and workforce-only organizations span a range of budgetary categories, uh, with neither type tending to be exclusively small or large, and historically has been difficult to provide specificity and hard data on the totality of the workforce system, including providers, clients, programs, and outcomes due to the sheer size of the ecosystem, administrative diversity, and an overall lack of shared information infrastructure. Uh, that is to say, as you all know, we have a very complex ecosystem that is a system in name and efforts to collaborate and serve together, uh, but does need some support in both from the job seeker side on um, accessing these services, as well as on the service provider side on uh, connecting to one another and sharing uh, infrastructure and uh, accessibility. Next slide. Here we have a look at uh, who we're serving. The next few slides are kind of who, who our clients are. Here you can see the breakdown by age. So organiza organizations are serving a range of New Yorkers from teens to seniors, but many serve constituencies that are most in need of help surmounting significant labor market barriers, including justice involved populations those in foster care or without access to stable housing, as well as parents without access to child care. Nearly <laughs> all organizations work with younger adults with slightly more serving incumbent adult and um, 55 plus workers, so older adults. This is important to note from the perspective that a lot of policy and discourse is rightly focused on youth needs, uh, mm -hmm. given the fact that young if you kind of catch people early on in their lives and their careers you can have a much uh, better outcome uh, in helping them succeed however you can see here that there's also a large need on the adult and older adult side uh, based on need depth of intervention and supports that are required to help people counteract the the needs that they have uh, but so this is why we at the coalition tend to advocate for the needs of um, a greater focus on the adult population, um, given given the fact that they make up a, a slightly outsized amount of clients. Next slide. While workforce organizations tend to serve a wide range of constituencies, we asked organizations to select up to five demographics that were the focus of their programming. Programs for women led the list, followed by high school students, NYCHA residents, immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, parents, and justice-involved individuals. Again, this is just number of organizations serving these clients, not uh, quantity of client. Uh, so that's just a little bit of a difficult um, metric to understand. The fact that a majority of organizations serve women and especially women of color is a theme that you'll see come across the report and is something that needs to be reflected in policy and programming decisions. Similarly, women and especially women of color make up a majority of the workforce within service providers and the workforce sector as a whole. Uh, so the needs of, of women and women of color as a client are also reflected in the needs of the workforce making up the sector itself. Uh, so an impact on, for example, child care and wraparound supports on the client population will have a similarly positive impact on the workforce of the sector itself. Uh, so, so remembering that service providers are employers themselves. Next slide. Uh, as you can see here, workforce development nonprofits have a multidimensional Apologies for the noise and background. Workforce uh, organizations have a multidimensional approach to assisting their constituents, connecting them to economic assistance where that is needed, identifying their skill and of the workforce needs, 
and providing essential support services to enable people to access and thrive in uh, services while participating in training, education, or other workforce programs. The city relies on these organizations for all of this, uh, with workforce organizations serving as the frontline conduit between the city and its low-income residents. Workforce organizations provide a range of services to New York City residents and job seekers, including career readiness, job placement, and career advancement services, uh, which lead the list. Programs often offered a range of practical help to make it possible for job seekers to attend and complete training programs, as well as meet basic needs from transportation, food and meals to stipends and direct cash assistance. It is significant there are, that there are less organizations serving child care, given the fact that child care consistently comes up as a major need, particularly uh, in the pandemic. And the reason that we uh, chose to ask here whether they provide these services directly or provide it by a partner is to emphasize the high level of collaboration and partnership that occurs amongst the system. Uh, but this is also a high level of uh, a place where it needs to be improved um, and can be uh, supported by the city itself. Next slide. The sectors with the highest number of trainings and programs citywide here are technology, construction, and healthcare. Um, by contrast, only five organizations offer services or training in the child sec child care sector and 12 in transportation. While not every training leads to a credential certification, there are a wide variety of credentials that New Yorkers can receive through training. Within the report, you can um, you can look through where we detail some of the associated credentials and certificates that organizations offer for kind of the top sectors, including tech, construction, healthcare, food and hospitality, as well as common cross sectoral trainings like administrative facilities and security. Many of the many of these feature in other category that include a number of programs in development and customized training and certifications. Uh, this reflects the innovation and employee engagement that's taking place across the sector and is, again, particularly important uh, in this post pandemic economy where we have a number of sectors that have uh, are still kind of having a hard time coming back, as well as a number of sectors that are emerging and changing. And last next slide, uh, we show a geographic scope of the sector. Uh, you can see there's over 250, loca the 143 organizations that we uh, surveyed have nearly 250 locations across the five boroughs offering hundreds of trainings. This illustrates the wide variety and specificity of program offerings and potentially points to providers response to client and employer needs. However, it's really important to note that while the Bronx, Staten Island have the highest unemployment rates, they have the least amount of programs located there making this a large issue, both in terms of accessibility and equity. Um, next slide. Uh, so now I will hand it over to my colleague Sharon, who will walk us through a number of challenges that we found across both providers and job seekers being served by the sector. <clears throat> Thanks, Annie. Um, again, good morning, everyone. Um, Sharon Sewell Framman here, and just a little bit about WPTI for those of you who are not familiar with our organization. We, we provide uh, training and capacity building as well as system building services, primarily to um, uh, uh, the community based organizations um, in the field and work closely uh, with our uh, intermediary partners like Jobs First. Um, and um, uh, the New York City Employment and Training Coalition and NIATEP and others, uh, in addition to our city agency uh, partners and, um, and CUNY as well. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the challenges that we're seeing um, based on the 143 respondents, some of them are persistent systemic issues while that have been exacerbated by the pandemic, while others are, um, are sort of newer issues uh, as, as a direct outgrowth and result of the pandemic. So more than half of our response, uh, respondents 
um, uh, cited extreme challenges um, to moderate challenges with uh, client recruitment, funding, staff recruitment, administrative burden, uh, digital technology and infrastructure, and of course, uh, client retention. And so in terms of the systemic issues, um, in, in terms of funding, many of you know that the workforce development ecosystem um, has about 680, 687, um, $678 million in funding. And it's supplemented by about $77 uh, million dollars from uh, private philanthropic um, uh, sources um, as well. And so uh, I, I, more than half of the respondents cited funding as a real challenge. Many of these organizations uh, faced drastic cuts over the past few years um, and so limited uh, their ability to provide uh, needed services. The other issue around uh, funding um, is that, um, just so uh, you all know, that um, that more than um, half of the respondents, as you know, are multi-service organizations, and um, they get about 36 um, percent uh, of the funding compared to workforce or smaller uh, workforce organizations that get uh, approximately 26% of those uh, of the, the government funding. The other uh, challenge is the administrative burden. And more than a quarter of the organization said that their administrative burden was very or uh, very extremely challenging. Now, um, based on the ecosystem, as, you, as many of you know, um, there is about um, 75 different public funding streams administered by 21 different uh, city, approximately 21 different city agencies, uh, all requiring different reporting requirements, um, as well as <clears throat> as well as performance requirements, and we uh, consistently struggle with, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a common sort of uh, metrics in defining um, success. Um, and, and while I wanna applaud the city led by the New York City uh, uh, economic uh, mobility and Ty Walker around the common metrics, uh, there's, uh, and, and working with the, with the city agencies, um, there's still some challenges in terms of uh, common reporting, uh, contracting issues, reimbursement issues, um, with, the, with the broader workforce uh, providers. And we see that show up here. Um, in terms of um, more programmatic challenges and job seeker challenges, we see that um, client recruitment has become a, uh, a real issue. And, and that's because in terms of, uh, of client, they have different uh, preferences. Um, many of those uh, clients uh, do not want to go back to the job they had previously. Um, the skill requirements is changed and now exacerbated with the, the higher inflation and just um, the, the housing issues with the pandemic. Uh, there's more um, uh, uh, there, there's more sort of needs around housing, uh, legal, um, child care, as Annie mentioned, and other things that uh, that really inhibits um, client recruitment and retention in these programs. Um, secondly, uh, staff staff recruitment has become an issue as well. Uh, as you, as Annie mentioned, the job seekers are many of the organizations serve primarily women, and you will see that. The workforce, uh, in the words of Sheila McGuire, the workforce workforce sector parallels the job seekers they serve, and that is uh, the majority of uh, of individuals in the workforce sector that works on the front line are women, uh, many women of color, while 74% of them uh, have a, uh, a bachelor's or an advanced degree, when compared to 44%. Of the of the labor market, the citywide labor market, 
Um, many of them are um, <clears throat> uh, many of them are low paid, right? And so we'll move to the next slide in a bit to talk a little bit more about that. And then um, <clears throat> thirdly, uh, the lack of or the underinvestment in um, digital and data infrastructure has been, um, we have seen that sort of rise to the top over the past two years when um, many organizations had to provide remote service delivery. Next slide, please. All right, so as Annie mentioned, many of the organizations um, that provide job training and education services are small to mid-sized organizations with a budget of $5 million or less. And so um, the workforce sector, again, parallels the broader labor market in terms of uh, the great resignation um, challenges. And so uh, things like pay equity is a real issue. Um, in 2020, Workforce Professional Training Institute um, did a study uh, voices from the, the front lines, and uh, more than um, half of the respondents uh, said that the average wage was $55,000 that is paid to the frontline practitioners. Now, um, 10 years ago, we did a similar study, and the average wage was about $50,000 at that time. If you look at um, the, the rate of inflation and the cost of living increase, um, frontline workers are making and taking home less pay than they were uh, 10 years ago with, uh, with, you know, and having to deal with a higher cost of living. So the bottom line is that um, pay equity is low on the front lines um, and it's across uh, racial lines. Second, uh, trauma and burnout. Um, uh, prior to the pandemic, they had to wear multiple hats and um, deal with heavy issues uh, given the target population. The, the, uh, the uh, COVID pandemic over the past uh, couple of years exacerbated that. Um, job quality and career advancement issues is a big, uh, was cited as a big issue. Again, with the health concerns, uh, the health issues, um, benefits, scheduling, those are all things that I know uh, the, the, the Workforce Development Board members care about, and we're seeing those issues um, as well in the workforce sector. Uh, lastly, the, the talent um, and professional development. Given the shift, uh, the digital economy, the shift to our remote and hybrid, um, there's an increased need for digital literacy and fluency, so there's a lot of reskilling and upskilling needed uh, for the sector. Next slide, please. Um, again, um, when it comes to the, the more systemic issues of, of funding sources, just on a high level, and I mentioned this before, you can see that uh, multi-service organizations get the bulk of the um, the city dollars uh, or the public dollars, uh, primarily from the city, while workforce development organizations get a get a, a much uh, lower portion, um, and so uh, there there are challenges with not only um, as we said before um, pay equity compensation, but uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the tension between the higher demand for services such as legal housing, childcare. Um, and training, uh, training and placement services. Um, so with that, next slide, please. All right. And so um, in terms of in terms of challenges with job seekers, um, in terms of the organizations we surveyed, uh, more than half of them said that uh, job seekers now have uh, change in preferences um, and, um, and, and sort of employment practices. For example, many of the, the frontline um, job seekers do not want to go back to jobs they had uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, they're concerned, they have health concerns. They now have childcare issues. Um, uh, some of them prefer remote work. 
um, higher pay because many of the frontline jobs pre-pandemic research has shown that they were in um, they were low wage jobs with um, uh, job quality um, sort of challenges. And so um, now, as we know, given the great resignation and the fact that especially frontline work workers are looking for more meaning, um, more fulfillment in their jobs, more flexibility, and the ability to uh, get higher pay, career advancement, um, those things are, are really um, uh, um, uh, important. And so shift in needs uh, in terms of and employment patterns with the job seekers, um, really looking at um, immediate needs such as housing and food um, insecurity and other things, surviving uh, versus thriving, and, and really um, some other uh, additional issues, including um, childcare issues uh, that has is, that is cropped up here. Next slide, please. Can you, can I be my Sure, go ahead, Annie. If you can actually go back to the slide. slide. Next one. This one, yeah. So just to flag that this is only half of the, the visual that we have in the report. Um, we emphasized for you all, uh, if someone can mute themselves, because I'm there, thank you. Um, this only demonstrates the services that have the highest percentage of not being able to meet demand. So you will note here that these are all wrap, most of these are wrap around and support demand, demonstrating the fact that while people do have interest in participating in training and employment services, they're unable to do so because they have much higher challenges that are falling into the category of survival. So people are unable to participate in the services that we are providing and that the city is paying for on the training and employment side because of this huge, much larger kind of pandemic driven need. Uh, so if we want to, the what we've talked about for a very long time has now been exacerbated by the pandemic. And um, it is, we believe that the city and state need to focus on pairing a wraparound recruitment and stipend supports um, in order to maximize their training and um, employment services investments. Um, so Sharon, thanks, back. Yeah, thanks Annie for that, that um, additional uh, clarification. Um, and next slide, please. And so <clears throat> nearly half of the, the, the 143 organizations are focused on really maintaining, delivering and evolving as well as scaling their programs. Um, uh, based on research from the new school, over 200,000 jobs are, are, are still, um, we, we're still at a loss of 200,000 jobs. Um, and, and, you know, based on the pre-pandemic numbers. And so, uh, as, as Annie mentioned, we see a need to, uh, to really reskill, upskill uh, job seekers, but also provide wraparound services. So there is a real focus on maintaining, delivering, evolving, and scaling um, programs. Secondly, um, the technology and data infrastructure. Um, really, really important in terms of um, investment. Um, and so uh, one of the priorities is that uh, many of the organization uh, organizations are focused on really building their data and collection and sharing systems, as well as um, uh, leveraging different platforms for service delivery. Um, high cost uh, requires uh, significant investment. And we'll talk a little bit more later about um, that, uh, the state funding that could potentially help them. Um, staffing, um, again, important, given that many of the small to mid-sized organizations are um, only budget is 5 million or less. Um, there's a real sort of focus and need to provide competitive wages and benefits and to support the staff with trauma and burnout. Um, and so, and to be able to uh, uh, not only recruit high quality staff, uh, but to retain them as well. And then um, there is now a tension 
between providing in-person, hybrid, um, and remote programming. Uh, many organizations have to significantly shift their infrastructure to be able to provide uh, effectively and efficiently provide uh, remote services as well. Next slide. So um, in overall, our main takeaways, um, again, is at a very high level, and Annie, feel free to weigh in here as well, is funding. Um, we talked about the 678 million. Um, based on our survey, 120 organizations said they serve about 300,000 people uh, per year. Um, that's a sizable amount and growing. Um, and that's not the entire uh, uh, um, number of pr uh, providers. And so um, a, a, a need for funding, uh, private funding helps. Um, it does support, uh, it's a little bit more flexible. It support innovation and, and partnership building and other infrastructure en enhancement, but really need more um, dollars in the system uh, to be able to uh, make significant um, improvements and advancement in the structure. In terms of, um, uh, I just wanna bring to bear, many of you know this, uh, but just to remind you, um, you know, Melinda Mack from NIATEP consistently says that um, there's still uh, a significant amount of um, state funding available from the 175 million uh, that, that was earmarked at the state uh, for, uh, for workforce development. Uh, and so we're encouraging you all as the workforce development board members and the city to, to really support the uh, providers in accessing that funding. A big uh, uh, obstacle to accessing that funding is the match needed um, for those particular contracts, as well as operational costs while uh, the contract is being uh, negotiated and reimbursed. Um, and then also there is, as you all know, uh, the Biden administration allocated about $275 uh, billion for uh, digital um, and technical infrastructure building. Um, the states have to submit a plan. And so we, we encourage the city to, to, to work with the state um, to include uh, not only the city agencies, but the, uh, the workforce providers on the front line, particularly the smaller to mid-size mid uh, organizations who really need to build their infrastructure. And then lastly, um, <clears throat> there's about uh, uh, 300 million that's going to be poured into the system for workforce development with approximately $50 million for infrastructure. We asked the, the board and the city to, to really uh, follow the development of that and, and really help uh, to support uh, the providers. Shared definition of success, uniform data uh, infrastructure, again, is a persistent systemic issue. Um, we've made progress with the city's common met metrics, but more needs to be done. And of course, the administrative burden. Uh, in terms of the staffing, um, pay equity, job quality, reskilling, upskilling the practitioners, um, and then operational costs. Um, we really need to invest more in the system. It's been hopefully, woefully, infrastructure has been woefully underfunded. Um, it does take significant resources, and it's important to do this at this time to be able to offer uh, scalable programming um, and to meet the needs of the the, the, the residents uh, for the recovery. And then in terms of program evolution and innovation, um, adjusting to the needs of the job seekers, that's critical. Um, there's a lot of sector-based training. It varies in terms of uh, depth, quality. Um, and so continuing to focus on sector-based strategies. And um, lastly, um, <clears throat> Uh, investing in the um, the talent needs and the infrastructure. Um, so with that, Annie, do you have anything else to add uh, before we, we wrap up? No, I think um, I want to leave it open for questions. So yeah. this is pretty. Thanks. Yeah, that's why I wanted to be able to have the uh, opportunity for the board to weigh in. So is this like the wrap up slide? Does the wrap up slide just want to point out some action steps? Obviously, we all want to be joined together in advocacy. The employer voice is particularly important here. Um, Chris has shared the re report link and a number of other links with you all. 
particularly uh, WPTI's work on the practitioner side and our work on how COVID has impacted the providers. And last but not least, we have a conference coming up in just uh, under a month. Would love to see many of you there. Um, and so you can go to our website uh, for that information. Thank you for that. Sorry, we completely ran really past the 15 minute allotment, but there was a lot to share. <laughs> That's information to share, but if you have any questions, I will take them at this time or you can forward them to Chris and we will address them given the schedule. I was just wondering if um, any, you know, board members wanted to sort of weigh in with kind of, you know, any thoughts, reflections, um, you know, sort of what, what can the board be doing in light of the um, findings of this report? I see Lenore, take it away. Okay, just trying to unmute myself. Thank you, Very, super comprehensive, interesting report. I had a couple questions. One is, did this survey include um, training programs that are collectively bargained with labor unions? And um, there's some great models for pre-employment training within the construction industry, both apprentice, you know, pre-apprentice programs, and some of them are, have very targeted populations like uh, non-traditional employment for women that, that looks to prepare women or helmets to hard hats, that's returning veterans. And um, then, then uh, uh, post-employment training, they're also like my own union, 32BJ has an amazing training that's collectively bargained, paid for completely by employer contributions. It's you know, able to provide state-of-the-art training that evolves as technology and the industry evolves. That's very tailored to the industry. It's based on a labor management partnership, kind of managed jointly by union and the employers in the industry. So it can really um, <clears throat> um, adapt and provide uh, workers and career paths for people once they have a job. So. Um, there are some models out there that are um, paid for by employers in the industries that are sort of tailored to the industries that are important to look at, and they're very connected to a job. So it's not kind of training people and then um, who knows what's going to happen. Maybe people will get hired or maybe they won't. But both the, the construction side, apprentice and pre-apprentice programs are very connected um, to, to jobs and the once on the job, people, the participants are already working. And so it creates opportunities for people to move up, to advance, to get the skills and licenses and certifications they need um, to perform their job um, or to advance on their job. Um, and before you answer that, I, I, I was we were remiss in saying in not saying that um, uh, we have been working closely with um, Joe McDermott and his team over at the Consortium for Worker Education, and uh, he's been very much part of the pro this process um, and 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 sort of data gathering and analysis, and um, and so um, the 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 union side and the job seeker voice. Um, has been very prevalent in terms of our findings um, and in terms of um, the next evolution uh, and the report that we're going to be putting out. Go ahead, Annie. Uh, right. So what uh, this is this is part one of two two reports. So this first report was predominantly pre, by predominantly I mean ninety percent, ninety to ninety five percent non labor apprenticeship did not have apprenticeships. It did have all the pre-apprenticeship um, organizations that you mentioned and others. So yes, that side is covered, but not the secondary side uh, as much. And so we're working on having the second report include more of the labor piece as well as, and the second report will really focus more on how the system reflects labor market needs uh, and uh, we'll go a lot more into analysis and recommendations so yes and no but i think that is part of the thing that you're pointing out is the historical challenge of incorporating a, a variety of union tracks in the cbo kind of early stage and later stage 
connection between community uh, organizations and union. I see a hand up from Mark. Yeah. Mark, you want to unmute? Hi, Annie and Sharon. Uh, well, congratulations on a fantastic report. It's great to see uh, all the work that's gone into this. I had a few thoughts and questions. Um, it might be useful to know some of the challenges by the size of the organization, as opposed to just having them all together and whether the small organizations struggle with some of these issues more than the large ones or vice versa, just in terms of thinking about interventions. Uh, Sharon, you mentioned 300,000 served. That is a humongous number. It'd be great if you guys could follow up with something around the performance with that 300,000. Um, how many, I assume that's 300,000 being served as workforce clients, uh, not in all the other services. And so Absolutely. how many of them get jobs and how many of that, what are the wages uh, would be tremendous because it outstrips what the um, our uh, career centers are doing by uh, uh, quite a bit. So it's a really extraordinary. And then uh, a thought for another report you mentioned the number of city agencies that are providing workforce development funding and the challenges of contracting and reimbursement. Uh, I think it'd be very useful for the board to have information that was kind of a report card from the providers that really highlighted which agencies were easier to work with one and which ones were harder. We have no feedback from the contracted agencies about what those challenges are and and never really hear about them so uh it strikes me that you're probably finding some easier to work with than others and it'd be good for us to know no uh thanks for those comments and um and sort of recommendations uh just a quick clarifying point mark and that is um, of the 143 organizations we service uh we surveyed 123 uh, reported that collectively they serve about 300,000 um, folks, and that's exclusively workforce development services. When we look at multi-services organizations, that that number goes up to uh, about 2.3 million. Um, Annie, you could um, sort of uh, confirm that, um, but uh, but but that's a, that's sizable and significant, and that has significantly increased in the past two years. So you can see the tension um, that especially these smaller organizations have given their funding. Yeah, there's a lot of data that we didn't publish in this report. Um, originally, it was planned to be 10 pages and it already blew up. So we have a lot more data that we have to parse through, uh, including the buy size. Uh, the, the other pieces that you mentioned, though, in terms of um, gauging quality and impact, is a lot trickier to do given the previous conversation around shared metrics and other organizations have attempted to do that in the past and they've hit a lot of walls so i think that's a much larger collaboration that needs to take place and first the shared metrics need to be and definitions need to be taken care of and also we as a, an advocacy organization that's kind of where we hit our barrier um because we want to be able to support organizations without um, and supporting the system uh, without creating a wall between um, you know we want to be a good arbiter between the various players and lastly agree on a lot of the other needs that you emphasized i think the entire system requires a much more serious look at itself and requires more types of measurement uh, that you the organizations like yours do so that would be a pitch for a lot more funding also needs to go into the innovation and measurement element. Uh, but again, we as both WPTI and ETC do, you know, would love to find that kind of funding, would love any foundations that are interested in working with us on doing that kind of analysis. Um, but as of yet, no one has stepped up. So we are a little bit over time, but I do see that Les has his hand up. So I want to get uh, Les's voice in here. And if there's anyone else, pop your hand up right now. 
<laughs> um, Great. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah. Uh, so you, you mentioned in your report. Uh, I think we lost you last. Last examples because you know. We, I'm sorry. You mentioned uh, administrative burdens as being one of the uh, topics that kept coming up in the results. And I'm wondering if you could give us some examples of what those administrative burdens are. Um, uh, I think one example of um, the administrative burden is um, there's because of the, the lack of um, um, shared uh, uh, common sort of metrics and, and definition of success. Um, different city agencies require different, um, slightly different uh, performance requirements, reporting requirements, um, and, and in, in some cases, different systems. And so um, the providers spend um, a, a significant, based on the, the report, the, the survey, a significant amount of time um, on the reporting requirements um, and um, also um, when it comes to the contract process, there are things uh, like, um, you know, uh, the time the contracts get registered and, and payment is dispersed um, and, you know, things like operational challenges uh, to be able to, 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 to move forward with the programming um, before they're, be, they're able to reimburse. So and those are just uh, two of those significant uh, sort of challenges that is that that people share and also i'm sorry a quick follow-up are does your report make suggestions in this area about what the city can do to, to streamline the process um that that will come less in the next report um we this is primarily an educational tool and we want to be able to gather uh more data from the demand side of the equation to then be able to give a good um um, you know, set of recommendations. Not in some of them are not inconsistent when it comes to administrative burden with some recommendations that have been put forth before by like the New York City Workforce Funders um, and other work groups um, across the city. Annie, did you want to um, say something? That's okay. We'll cover it next time. Sharon covered it all. Okay. So thank you, Sharon and Annie, um, for sharing that report and the information and what um, we can look forward to in the upcoming reports. Thank you to the board members for their questions and discussion and reflection. Thank you for having us. Uh, and I guess the final takeaway I want I do want to emphasize is that ultimately these service providers are your service providers they are the ones that are doing the work on behalf of the city and there is over the years we've seen an extreme amount of enthusiasm and desire for partnership and collaboration uh, and also understanding that they are employers themselves so there is especially now with the the way that the mayor has set forward his vision uh, we are all on board with wanting to do this work together and a lot of the suggestions that you've put forward about things that need to be analyzed and things that need to be improved the service providers themselves want that and see that so it's not so much a lack of interest as a lack of resources and being at the table early when these decisions are made so we're super excited about a lot of um kind of the the way that the mayor's blueprint has been rolled out the task force that's coming out and are very much hoping that the landscape is like Sharon pointed out an educational tool to set the foundation of how we all work together uh, so really appreciate the fact that you've given us this much time and have uh, really done a deep dive on the data that we've provided and it's here for uh, for all of us to kind of work on together I just want to say a quick thing. I know you guys got to move on, but I, I see Abby Joe, and I'm just asking the board to work very um, uh, closely with Chris and Abby Joe and, and the mayor's office to 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 be able to access some of the state funding and the um, and the federal funding that's coming down 
um, to be able to support uh, not only, again, the city agencies, but the practitioners who really need an investment and infusion of resources uh, to be responsive to their um, constituents. Thank you both for those really important closing thoughts and um, <clears throat> basically charging us with <laughs> putting down, laying down that gauntlet for what we need to do as a board. I really appreciate it. Uh, Andrea? Yes, Joe. Yes, Joe. Um, first, the report is so important. It's so terrific. It just gives us, gives you a presence of what we're facing and what we have to do. Thank you very, very much. But I hate to have these you go because you mentioned one major problem, administrative burden. And it's a difficulty that groups can't get a contract from the city or from SED or from Empire State within a year. Uh, thank God we have different sources of funds so that our community groups can have an MOU with us and we can pay them ahead of time because of a credit line or other sources. We know community groups, you both know community groups that had to turn down a possibility of a grant because they didn't have the cash flow. And um, for, for example, we have, a, we, have, we, have, we have a certificate program from state ed. We just, we have to pay people ahead of time. We just got a contract from two years ago for the paying from for, I can repeat that at every site where agencies complain. City council complains. Everybody complains about contract development. You have to go through this department. Oh, you might get it next month. You have to go through this department. Wait, the law department wants to look at it again. It, it is a dramatic interruption for groups and in, in, uh, CBOs and functioning. And thank you for the report. You guys are just terrific. Thank you for putting that out there, Joe. Uh -uh. Okay, so now um, Chris and Grant had actually notified, we're moving to the next item around the executive order. Um, and Chris and Grant had shared with us in an email uh, last month, Mayor Adams signed an executive order that officially created the Mayor's Office of Talent and Workforce Development. The executive order also detailed the scope, authority, and responsibilities of the office. We are pleased to welcome back Abby Jo Siegel, who spoke with us in June, um, the executive director of the Mayor's Office of Talent and Workforce Development, who will provide us with an overview of the executive order and how she and her team are starting to implement it. Abby Jo, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. It's so good to see everybody. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is a little bit um, sore today. So if I'm drinking water, that's why. That's why. So first of all, I want to thank um, um, Chris and the team and the board and also um, very much um, the city agencies, uh, particularly hats off to um, DYCD and hitting 100,000 summer youth employment jobs. Um, we know that's super important. Grant, I don't think we need to share the screen. Just put it in the in the chat. I think it's, it's good to see to see folks. Thanks. Um, so hats off and um, and thanks. Thank you very much to New York City ETC and WPTI and all of the um, participating organizations in your membership and who participated in the survey. Um, incredibly important information and data and it couldn't be more timely. Um, it really sets the stage and, and, and it sort of explains why um, for those of us who have been working in workforce development, why the executive order um, is, is so needed in the announcement. So I think we all heard um, 75 different funding streams, over 21 different agencies, um, and there hadn't really been a structure in place on this on the public side, and particularly you know in this case on the city side, to really think about these questions collectively. And and now we have that in place. So for those of you who um, weren't aware, on August 15th we had a big announcement up at um, Bronx Community College and a good number of you all were there, so thank you. And we certainly couldn't have had that announcement, but for the work of many of you, um, both you know, past as well as what I am hoping very much in the future. And so I'll just go through quickly what's in the executive order. 
Um, so one, it, 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 part of it was to announce the, um, the pathways, the New York City pathways to industrial and construction careers. And my colleague, Miles Gamble, will share more on that. Um, but that's super exciting. We were um, one of 32 um, winners for the Good Jobs Challenge out of a very competitive environment of well over 500 submissions nationally. And it's super exciting. I think speaks to a number of things that have come up um, both through this recent report, but also um, from this group over time. So I'll let Miles speak to that. So I'm going to just hone in on what's in the Executive Order 22. Um, so as was, I believe, mentioned, it was it's the order that actually is the first time we've formalized the Office of Talent, the Mayor's Office of Talent and Workforce Development for New York City. There's never been anything formalizing this office. So um, that's a real testament to the fact um, of the folks who've been working on this for a long time out of this office, as well as the vision um, vision of the of the mayor and the and the lead, lead leaders of the city, but also from all of you and the advocates really saying we need to have this function. We need to make sure we're we're structured that, that the city can be a good partner to the private sector, both on the nonprofit provider side, um, also on the on the for the employers, as well as for our educational institutions. So there's there's three aspects of the um, executive order. Um, so one is it really empowers this office um, and it empowers it around citywide objectives to make sure we as a city are strategic about how we're addressing the talent and workforce needs of New York City residents as well as those of employers. Um, so there's there's six really objectives in there and one is really making sure young people can launch successfully into fulfilling and economically secure careers by the time they're 25 years old. Additionally, making sure all New Yorkers in paid employment should be paid a living wage. So making sure we're addressing job quality as well as um, attachment. Um, three, employers should have the access to the local talent they need to thrive. We all know this is very much a public-private partnership. We can't um, have people in good jobs if we don't have employers who um, are in need of hiring people. Um, making sure the demographics of the workforce match those of the city. So really making sure we're, we're tackling um, particularly, you know, historic disparities. And so in that, making sure we're always disaggregating the data um, on employment and uh, unemployment and wage data sh to show progress in addressing that inequity. And then last, making sure that we're, we're using public resources efficiently and effectively. So that's actually set out in the executive order. In addition, there were some structural changes um, which are pretty exciting. So one is this office has always worked incredibly closely with the Mayor's Office of Youth Employment, formerly the Center, um, the Center of Youth Employment. And this executive order recognizes that that needs to happen even more seamlessly. So the two offices will be are, are we're integrating together. But there will continue to be a very, very strong focus on youth employment because we know developing talent is a huge piece of this puzzle when we talk about an overall system. Second, um, the industry partnerships, um, four of the major ones that have been um, that have been pioneered and incubated at small business services and have done incredible work, such as Tech Talent Pipeline and NIACH. Um, as well as MAKE, which um, works in manufacturing and industrial sector. And then, um, and then work, the one that focuses on construction have been moved over to the Office of Talent and Workforce Development. Um, it was really a testament to their success um, and their, their um, recognition of the good work that they've been doing and the opportunity they could do to, to expand, to serve more agencies across the city as well as play a bigger role. So super excited about that. The second two pieces of the um, of the executive order were one, we're convening the future of workers task force that we discussed at the last meeting. It's also in the blueprint, but it's really bringing together the external partners across the city to look forward into what do we need to do differently so we have a more coherent system to address the talent and workforce needs of the city and achieve the achieve the objectives I stated above. So that's super exciting. I want to highlight that one of the 
premises of that Future of Workers Task Force is we are not starting from scratch. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're very much building on all the good work that's been done across the field um, and making sure we translate that into real action and a system that really works for New Yorkers, for new employers, and for the city's economy overall. In addition, we've also set up the interagency, the, the Talent and Workforce Development Interagency Cabinet. So each of the agencies that even touch on workforce need to designate a senior level person as their chief workforce officer. And that cabinet will come together on a monthly basis and be res responsible to delivering an annual plan to the mayor on talent and workforce development. So we see this as an opportunity to address some of these issues that were that come up in, in the, the context um, today, um, as well as to make sure that we are actually tackling the disparities and the gaps we see around employment over time. And so that we can align the many different agencies as well as um, tackle some of the consistent barriers that we've heard. So those those both those entities will kick off this fall. Um, so very much looking forward to working with all of you um, and learning more about not only the data in this report, but the data that you're sitting on um, and also going to release to make sure we're using that to inform both the task force and the interagency cabinet. Um, so that in six months from now, we can have a much more clear picture and roadmap of what we need to do to address these key issues. And I know we're tight on time, so I'm gonna stop there, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. No questions. Any questions. <laughs> Silence this group, that's any reflections, any? Abby, I'll put a question into the ether. What does this mean for the Workforce Development Board? I think it's a real opportunity for us to look at the Workforce Development Board collectively and um, look across the country and in other places where we to make sure we are actually doing best practice um, and where we're not really evaluate what we what we may want to do differently. Um, but again, it builds on a lot of the good work that this that this group has are, that does, as well as um, the the all of us that sort of connect into the workforce development board in one way or another. Angie, I see you have your hand up. Thanks, Adria. Um, so just want to say it's really interesting to hear this really pretty seismic update, and then um, think about the prior presentation, and I think the notion of um, how we work, who we work, taking care of our workforce and making sure that we're thinking differently about those who, um, you know, we want and um, need to really focus on is really interesting. And so it's clear that there's a new day here. And again, the, the timing couldn't be better, um, I think, given all of the changes in the workforce. I have a colleague here at NYU, and her the tagline is, um, the future of work is human. <laughs> um, and I literally think that could be the tagline, so go ahead and feel free to steal it. But like literally, the, the future of work is human. And, it, and it's like, it's pretty, if you think about that and dissect it relative to today's conversation, I think that's really interesting and important. And um, just want to applaud um, you and all of the team on the great, great work. And and again, just the urge that we connect this conversation that you just had with the prior conversation, because I we obviously can't do it without changing up some of the ways in terms of how we operate as a community. Th thanks, Angie. And I, I just want to add, this is very this is coming from the top of the administration. Um, I've been in a number number of events recently with the mayor and a number of deputy mayors, as well as the um, the chancellors from CUNY and DOE, and very much recognizing that we have to put talent at the center of our citywide priorities and as our as center of our economic development strategy. Um, so it's not just over there or on the side, but very much on the center at the center. 
And so I think this is a huge opportunity for all of us who've been working on these issues for, for and many of you for many, many more years than I have, um, where, the, where the stars seem to be aligning at a particular point in time. And, and we have a fantastic window to, to really, you know, we're at, I would say, an inflection point, and it's a, it's a great opportunity. Any other reflections or thoughts, questions for Abby Jo around this? In the chat, see there's a link. Oh, okay. Please share the cabinet and future of work task force information coming from um, Alia. And will you include Mayor's offices on these teams. Yeah, so so absolutely, um, and definitely will include mayor's offices on the interagency cabinet in part um, because they often do some of the most innovative workforce programs that we see coming out of the city, partnering with many many folks in the field. And I just want to acknowledge, I hear everybody with the state and federal funding, and that will definitely be a priority. Um, in fact, I was at an event um, recently up in the Bronx with the um, with the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, they're, they're doing Jobs Corps 2.0 and was chatting with um, Brent Parton, who's the, I believe, assistant deputy secretary acting, you know, the, you think the city titles are lying, the federal ones are even more so. Um, and he was talking about the efforts that they're going to do at the federal level um, as part of the Good Jobs Initiative um, to really, uh, which is separate from the Good Jobs Challenge, of my understanding, but the Good Jobs Initiative to really um, work with um, cities and states to make sure as the various additional dollars through the infrastructure bill um, are released in different federal pots, et cetera, that there's a real focus on workforce and that they're trying to address from the federal side some of the challenges that, that you know, end of the day, the, the providers on the ground see, but is oftentimes the big issues for the agencies in terms of comply, compliance, which end up in some of the administrative burden that we're, that the practitioners on the ground are so challenged with. So it's exciting to have a partner um, thinking about at the federal level too. Um, additionally, the state recently appointed um, an executive director, I'm going to get this title wrong, for, for talent, for workforce development too, um, Amber Mooney Wrangle, and she's fantastic. So I'm optimistic we will have alignment there as well. And and uh, you know, Harry Joe, there's a lot of money still in Empire State that Ms. Mooney will have control over. And we need to talk to her as soon as possible about expanding or democratizing digital literacy, which is really something that all of us have got to consider as this year. You can't get a job without DS. And that's the Skills Coalition and coalitions all around the state. We have to have our own coalition. Uh, we have to have our own table of tech providers, not just for coding or Java or whatever, but it, we have to make digital literacy like we had in the 80s ESL. Everybody has got to do this. And Ms. Mooney is sitting on some money from a state we should look into it. I couldn't agree more, Joe. Um, and and I know that um, NYC ETC, as well as Melinda Mack and NIATAP, I'm are already thinking about um, how how to how to work with ESD on that, and, and happy to be part of those conversations. Additionally, it's um, I've heard several times coming out of the um, in the past month and a half out of the Department of Education um, from from the New York City Chancellor, as well as um, the, his senior folks, how important digital fluency is. Um, and so trying to really build it into the curriculum there as well. Yes, and uh, Melinda Mack is a gift. Yes. Which, but Annie and Sharon, so are you too. So. <laughs> I look indeed, to indeed. 
and to make Renault happy when we can include what the unions are doing and the union's obligation to all workers in this workforce development. Well, that, that's a good segue to the to the next item on the agenda when folks are ready. That sounds good. So thank you for teeing it up, Abby. <laughs> um, we're going to hear about a couple of additional recent exciting announcements related to workforce development in New York City. I am pleased to welcome Miles Gamble, Director of Employer Engagement for the Mayor's Office of Youth Employment. Miles will provide an update about a nearly $19 million grant. <clears throat> excuse me. Federal uh, Workforce Grant. Uh, that the city has won in partnership with Joe McDermott's organization, Consortium for Worker Education. Excuse me, Miles, I will let you take it away. Okay. Um, hello, can everybody hear me? All right, cool. Um, yes, well, hello everyone and good morning. Um, just to dive right in um, to Pathways to Industrial and Construction Careers, um, affectionately called NYC Pink. Um, our starting point was to find a, uh, find a project that would advance both that would advance equity through needed systems change, but just as importantly, identify a collaborative approach to create greater access to good paying jobs uh, for all New Yorkers. Um, after a series of conversations, considering several approaches, we were looking for ways to best serve um, cash cash assistance recipients in ways that would really change their financial and professional trajectory. Um, which is what made HRA the logical choice as lead partner on this application, which they are. Um, next slide. Okay. All right. Um, so some quick background on, on PINK. Uh, it came out of the Good Jobs Challenge as a part of the American Rescue Plan that was passed last year that allocated millions to the Economic Development Authority. Once again, as Abby mentioned, they only gave out about 32 awards nationwide, which really underscores the quality of our approach. The idea of the challenge is not to build a new system from scratch, but rather to connect existing programs and systems so that they can work more efficiently together. Um, next slide. Um, essentially, the way that PINK is organized is into two sectors, industrial transportation and construction. Um, these two sectors are aligned to Bi the Biden administration's priorities, especially considering the, the federal infrastructure bill that was enacted last fall. Um, next slide. Um, overall, this is just an example of the of the model. The model is really designed for HRE clients, um, our, and but as well as there's also intersections with folks who live in public housing as well. I want to make sure I mention that um, the target population are those are individuals with a high school diploma or equivalency, and the model itself is built off a current service infrastructure of HRE's employment service contractors, um, starting with an assessment for interest in both sectors and then quickly moving to short-term bridge programming that emphasizes basic job skills. Then after that, depending on the candidate's skill level and interest, they move into employment, short-term training, or even pre-apprenticeship. But also the model provides the crucial wraparound services um, to clients throughout the training and into employment as well. Um, next slide. Uh, to take a deeper dive into the programmatic approach, on the construction side, we are really looking closely at the project labor agreement with the Building and Construction Trades Council, um, or, or PLA uh, for that matter, um, and the $10 billion um, in city construction budget. We're also looking to successfully pipeline folks to internships and union jobs, of course, as well as training for back, for, um, back office positions. Um, in all, we are looking to train 750 uh, individuals and place 568 of those individuals into union or high quality jobs in construction. Next slide. Okay, um, on the industrial and transportation side, we are grateful to be working with the Consortium for Worker Education to create job pathways in transportation, utilities, and green infrastructure. Um, we're, we're seeking, of course, to leverage um, CWE's um, direct union and employer relationships, um, uh, training, and even their portal tools as well. Um, uh, ultimately, our approach here would be to train uh, over 1,600 and place over 1,200 into benefited employment with um, in the uh, industrial sector. 
Miles, I see a hands up. Do you oh, I'm sorry. Us? I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, ask, yeah. I'm asking you. Do you want us? I'm sorry. Let me look at the camera. Do you oh. want us to take questions now, like in the report, or would you prefer? Um, uh, I, 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 we, I could take it now. It's fine. Okay. It's yeah. It's almost through, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. Now who, I don't see the hand. Who had their hand raised? Oh, I'm sorry. Ro yeah, Robert Taylor, Youth Action, okay. Youth Build. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm sorry if I had interrupted your flow. I was uh, was waiting to get in the queue. I, I just wanted to ask a quick question around how, like, an agency like mine, which does a Youth Build program, which I think is a, nat a natural fit for um, what you're offering, and how do we get connected in? Oh yes, yeah. Um. So, uh, or actually, the next uh, darn yeah, I should have said that. The next slide actually has the network of support. Um. If Youth Build is not in there, then we should definitely um uh, talk more offline to see if how you guys get in. I actually used to work and uh, as a Section Three manager for New York, so I'm very familiar with um with you all. Um. Are you located at the 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 East Harlem one and um East Harlem location that's near Taino Towers, or are you at a different Youth Build location? Robert. Oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> are you at, are you at the one near T Taino Towers, or are you at a different exactly? Level? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Actually, we're I the think first I you thought we met. I thought we I thought we actually met like before the pandemic, but whatever. All right. Yeah. We'll definitely talk talk offline. But but again, just to underscore your point, like this is a deeply collaborative approach, and so this is this is why the network of support actually part actually speaks to what you're saying. So. Um, we are excited to be working with several agencies, organizations, training, and employer partners in order to meet the objectives of this initiative. And among the employers specifically, the priority has to be to get them to name specific opportunities, the job titles they're hiring for, the demand for said jobs, and, and how many individuals that they're looking to onboard through NYC Pink. So we really want to develop that kind of, um, that kind of synergy with employer partners um, as well. Um, uh, okay, next slide. This is actually the last the last slide. Um, so I could be able to answer more questions afterwards. The budget estimate. Um, this proposed budget, of course, like you know, near 19 million. Um, but this will leverage actually many times more its its amount in existing city programs and resources. It will support services to approximately 2,700 New Yorkers, um, including a projected 1,800 job placements all with living wages. Um, it will also build systems with HRA and partnerships beyond the agency to replicate this model in additional sectors and potentially additional populations. Um, the Another important thing to mention, yes, this funding is gated um, based on program metrics. And so, of course, we are thankful to be working with various entities and experts and all of you, of course, um, in the field uh, um, and of course, we are open to all referrals. We're open to um, all ideas from all of you. Um, yeah, thank you. Mr. Gamble. Yes. Can you go back to the previous slide on training partners? Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not the one controlling the. Uh, can you go back to the. Um, oh, oh yeah, whatever. training partners, Joe. CUNY, uh, this one, that one. The, the, right. Under the network of, yeah. It's very nice you have CDB as a backbone organization. Yes. But, I mean, we do realize that CW will be, be doing the training uh, for the uh, for those workers you have involved. Okay, you 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 you're you're talking about the um uh out of the network of of support. And the training providers you have. Uh, most of us, of course. They yes. For the these are mechanics, and now we just got a new grant for training uh, incumbent workers and electric cars. We'll put that into and BCC will do that. But your CUNY hosts, blah blah blah, apprentice readiness. Um, but I would like very much if you add to your slide the training providers for the new six million dollar grant CW got in partnership with the machinists. TW and the Teamsters, among other and uh, others. So you should have CUNY hosts, KCC, community, and BCC, and CWE and its union affiliates. 
Oh, yes. OK, absolutely. Thank you very much. I'm writing it down. <laughs> Greg, can we just go back to the slide before that one regarding the transportation? Um, I think I missed some of it because I screwed up the flow and I apologize, Miles. No, 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 do not. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to get out of I may have missed it, but can you just like highlight some of the positions that we're talking about in the um, in in the industrial and transportation sector? OK, yeah, so the industrial transportation sector is um, it's like sort of like um, not not a hodgepodge, of course, but just like, you know, a lot of different <laughs> positions within with under the banner of of industrial. I, I believe that um, uh, uh, construction is a bit more straightforward, but of course, I'm biased because I'm I come from that background. Um, but the under like, so for example, like CDL training um, for, for, for drivers or even like um, uh, utilities. So that means um, Con Edison, electric, you know, um, there's also, oh, right, um, um, not cable. Well, yes, cable as well with Verizon. And, um, and so it's utilities. You also have like um, transportation. Which also will deal with MTA, um, and uh, is that like, are those are the kind of examples you're looking for? Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, may I help here? Something you don't think about in this transportation industry, but we've been placing people with hornblower as cooks and and also in the owners of the ferries for uh, maintenance workers. Um, transportation covers so much. The real problem in New York City is that uh, people we represent, uh, Annie and uh, Sharon, you know, we represent and the unions, they don't have driver's license. We had a chance for for uh, 40 jobs with Hudson on, on JFK when after South uh, to South Jamaica House, and there were only 40 driver's license. Fortunately, SBS just gave us a grant, and we have a number of friends who can provide drivers like like uh, like uh, Cypress Hills who will be. But then we, it's 2,000 a driver's license. We have, if you can't get a CDL mid-sized truck, you can't get an accessorite job, you can't get, if you haven't got a driver's license, you can't get on a property of LaGuardia and JFK without a job. So that, uh, Mr. Gamble, the jobs in transportation, it's anything that moves, anything that moves, packages or people is transportation. And any, anybody who supplies the goods and services for the food for hospitals, that's transportation. And so uh, the per whoever asked that question, it's it's a really important, you mentioned Con Ed, you mentioned New, you mentioned, everybody has got to get in on this. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That, it was Adria who asked the question. I appreciate you fleshing that out. Thank you. Um, just to speak on, on, on what Joe just mentioned, because that's very important as well in terms of like, sort of like this is also addressing the, the, the existing barriers that may just stop folks from being able to work. Like, for example, if you can't get on JFK, if you do not have a license, you know, this may be, uh, this may actually stop a lot of individuals from moving forward to getting um, better paying jobs. But there's also um, something that we're working on, uh, license to careers, and that and that addresses that as well. And that also dovetails with with many of the objectives of of the the pink initiative as well. So I'm glad that um that that Joe brought that up because this that's what we're trying to identify, um, trying to identify in which ways that we already have programs um, and we already have uh, connections with employer and training partners to actually bring them together so that nobody's working in a silo, and then that way we can be able to like move forward from there. So. Thank you. And just on that note, I want to add that it's also to provide some of the wraparound supports that we know the HRA clients need. So that's part of the um, was part of the grants, very much part of the grants mission, and will be part of the implementation. Um, so things such as um, child care vouchers and and sort of trying to connect to housing um, as well as, as stipends.
So if there are no more questions, um, reflections, comments to share, then Abby Jo, I can turn it over to you again to talk about uh, the second announcement around uh, an initiative for career development and with high school students, publics, public high school students. Sure, and I'll, I'll be quick because I know we're close to time, um, but this past Monday, the um, the mayor and the school chancellor, um, the New York City Public School Chancellor, David Banks, um, and the New York, C New York Job CEO Council um, had a big announcement, um, and it was a true public-private partnership. Um, it was announcing a larger initiative by New York City Public Schools called Student Pathways, and this is really speaking to what the chancellor is talking about in terms of the public school system's North Star, which is really focusing on how do we put each student on a path to a rewarding, engaging career, as well as financial independence and long-term economic security. Um, so this is a very exciting North Star, um, particularly for those of us who've been working with DOE for a long time to have this sort of be um, put, put as a North Star and then resources and programs put behind it. And at, on Monday's event, they were announcing the um, Career Ready Modern Youth Apprenticeship Program where the CEO Council has committed to working in partnership with New York City public school students on modern youth apprentices. So it's a three, two to three year apprenticeship beginning in junior or senior year of high school. Um, and they've already done about a thousand of those over the past three years. There's a commitment to do a total of 3000 in the next, I forget the exact time, but in the near future, I wanna say the next two or three years. Um, and that was just one of the two initiatives that got funded by the city. The city invested $33 million in the student pathways work. Um, the other initiative is Future Ready, um, and more will come on that, but that's really focusing on pathways, building on the strong CTE programs, many of the strong CTE programs in DOE, but will expand to go across um, multiple types of schools, um, high schools, um, and really focused in to particular pathways that have promising career um, trajectories going forward. Um, so super exciting uh, that there's such a push for career connected learning. Um, and it's also very much not thinking about reinventing the wheel, but building on a lot of the good work that's been underway for a number of years. I'm happy to answer any questions on that, but I do think at some point we as a board should consider having um, someone from New York City Public Schools um, come and talk. Oh, and I should say at the announcement, it wasn't just the DOE chancellor that was there, but also the CUNY chancellor was there um, because these apprenticeships do go through to um, post-secondary and the goal is to make sure students get early college credit and college credit as they're doing the apprenticeship. Um, and it also speaks to the strong partnership that's that's continuing and, and expanding between DOE and CUNY around career, student career success. Thank you for sharing that. I think it would serve us as a board probably to have a presentation about it from um, you know, those who are most closely connected to it. So I look forward to that for sure. We can do that and if folks don't know the um, the New, well, she was appointed in January, one of the first appointments in the um, chancellor's office at, at, at New York Public Schools as chief of student path, pathways, Jade Grieve. She's been leading the work on behalf of the chancellor and the first um, the first deputy chancellor and just she's fantastic and doing amazing work. So maybe we can have her come. If there are no other questions, I just want to take the last two minutes and thank you, Abby Joe, for helping to keep us <laughs> to the time. Um, 
Our next board meeting is scheduled for December 1st, same time, I think probably the same time, 9 to 11. We have it on the calendar. Um, we're actually going to really try, see if we can do this one in person. So get ready, barring any kind of craziness and <laughs> flare ups or anything of that nature. Um, but I, I won't put that out into the universe. Um, so with that said, I will take a motion to adjourn today's board meeting. Nobody wants to go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, do I have a second to adjourn? Second. second. Thank, thank you, Dave. David. Um, okay, all in favor? Terrific. Hi. Hi. <laughs> great. Good to see everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Have a great weekend and look forward to hopefully connecting in person in December. Hi, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Adria. Thank you.